Are you a God-fearing man, Senator? It's such a strange phrase. I've always thought of God as a teacher, as a bringer of light, wisdom, and understanding. You see, I think what you really are afraid of is me. Happy heresies, and welcome to the desert of the real. Welcome with kindness and love to Aeon Bite Nonstick Radio, formerly known as Coffee, Cigarettes, and Gnosis. Broadcast from the virtual Alexandria through the God above God that can. You are not in Kansas anymore. If there is a hell, you might want to go there for some R&R. This is the always approachable yet incendiary discussion on history's most impactful, yet least known heretics, the Gnostics, as well as a Chinese phone book of blasphemy on their brethren in the esoterica and Dionysian free thought. We shy away from scholarly pontification and definitely avoid new age brain cell genocide. He who questions training only trains himself at asking questions. What? We take the middle road at reaching the Palace of Wisdom, although this road is cobbled with the excess of Pandora truths. And yes, and also, and as always, we don't take prisoners at Aeon Bite, but liberate them. We are not the final authority on anything, but hope to be an endless possibility for everything. We are not here to make a better world, but help you SimCity better inner worlds. We are long past taking red pills and this civilization imploding under the weight of its own self-denial and self-importance, but instead offer red suppositories that will cleanse your psychic bowels once and for all. It's a great thing when you realize you still have the ability to surprise yourself. Makes you wonder what else you can do that you've forgotten about. Forget about being the change you want to see in the world, as Gandhi said, but be the strange you want to see in the world. Oh, you Promethean artists and cyberspace troubadours and hipster pilgrims of the multiverse. Paraphrasing Rush and Tom Sawyer, our mind is not for rent by any god or government. Catch the myth, catch the myth, catch the mystery, catch the drift. I am not a number, I am a free man! Ergo, you have arrived here once again, in this eternal now, to write your own gospel and live your own myth, like the Gnostics have done throughout history, even as they were rewritten out of history. You are here to be more than you've allowed yourself to be, in endless lifetimes, soul raped by hating angels within the prison yard known as the Ouroboros. What would you do if you were stuck in one place and every day was exactly the same and nothing that you did mattered? Now that sums it up for me. You are becoming in slow burn and afterglow, a knower of the unknown, a Gnosticoi. You are the revenge of the myth a lord of deconstruction, and the word made on flesh. You are a Johnny Cash Bodhisattva, giving the finger to the black hole sons of the ancient of days, good old Yaldi Baldi. I am the supreme being, I'm not entirely dim. You are an existentialist Galahad, sailing the seas of fate through the gnashing rocks of orthodoxy, all the way to the farthest shores of imagination. And you, and I, and all of us are raging against heaven for our paradises lost and misplaced childhoods. At my signal, unleash hell. The powers and principalities once upon the machine's dream told us that we are of one dreadful, pitiful brew. But the Logos has told us we are avatars of infinity in a foreign land, forced to wear monkey skins and find new gods on our plasma TVs or smartphones. 
can't just go around doing whatever you feel like. You can't. There are rules in life. Like the Gospel of Philip states, the Archons wanted to deceive man since they saw that he had kingship with those that are truly good. They took the name of those that are good and gave it to those that are not good, so that through the names they might deceive him and bind them to those that are not good. And afterwards, what a favor they do for them. They make them be removed from those that are not good and place them among those that are good. These things they knew, for they wanted to take the free man and make him a slave to them forever. Inside the Matrix, they are everyone and they are no one. So we're on the cosmic rag right now, singing Twisted Sister, and we're taking it all the way to where the buck, the yen, the pound, and the PayPal account stops. We're coming for you. Jehovah. Listen to me. You have to consider the possibility that God does not like you. He never wanted you. In all probability, he hates you. This is not the worst thing that can happen. It isn't. We don't need him. We don't hate we, we got Fuck me. damnation, man. Fuck redemption. We are God's unwanted children. So be it. I thank you from the bottom of my untamed heart to those of you who have supported Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. Listened every week, purchased past episodes, kindly donated some shekels, bought Voices of Gnosticism or the Gospel of Thomas album, and told all of your friends of this revolution in the name of Hypatia of Alexandria that is literally aeons in the making. We are but hobbits taking rings of false realities to the lavas of higher consciousness but we're growing bit by bit, even if it's a long journey and the sorrows of corporate media attempt to slay us. Or maybe just visualize the ending of Finding Nemo for a better analogy, with us the little fishes in the net pushing against the collective grasp of a predatory society. You know what crazy is? Crazy is majority rules. Yeah, huh? Regardless, Thank you for your support. I am, and I am Abraxas, the terrible god above god as the ancients knew him. That sanity-killing manifestation of the pleroma, or the fullness of the divine, as Basilides described when he channeled Carl Jung. I come to you in his mortal incarnation of Miguel Khan, somewhere in the lawful and frigid dystopia known as Chicago. I am a voice in the wilderness, crying out for your inner Christ and indwelling palace Athena. Free your mind. I am here to midwife the arcane secrets of this cosmos that are yours by holy and unholy right. Midwife that gnosis or divine knowledge that will help you find the mysteries that work for you and only you. I am a dream of you, the spigot of truth from the Gospel of John. I am you, back and forth on the waters of a defective creation, along with a mournful Pista Sophia waiting for all of us to return home, the treasury of light. It is death who should be afraid of us. But if you're not interested in finding out who you really are, accepting that your internal and external solar systems are mostly as counterfeit as a Kardashian brainwave, then turn off the show. Go do some slacktivism on Facebook or tweet to the world the exact hues of the stains on your underwear after you went to Chipotle's for lunch. Go away if you don't want to face reality and the reality behind reality. I know we're all pretty small in the big scheme of things, and I suppose the most you can hope for is to make some kind of difference. But what kind of difference have I made? What in the world is better because of me? 
Aeon Bite is only for those who wish to see who the man behind the curtain is, who wish to see through a glass darkly no more, finally obtain the mind of Christ, and become the living embodiment of the hero with a thousand faces. Aeon Bite is dedicated to individuals who are not afraid of following their bliss, living for their bliss, and ultimately dying for their bliss. This is a good death. <laughs> There's no shame in this. But before I continue with my Tommy Rod, I certainly should, and please allow me to introduce our astral guest and our topic on this approximately Saturday, January 29th, the year of our damn years 2011. I'm just really excited and as annoyingly giddy as Natalie Portman laughing away after receiving her Golden Globe Award. <laughs> or as excited as the kids from South Park after the authorities finally arrested Steven Spielberg and George Lucas for raping Indiana Jones in his latest movie and prostituting so many rich myths for profit. And that's because our astral guest has released one of those rare books on the Gnostics that is groundbreaking, an instant classic, and easily accessible to anyone thirsting for the fascinating days of the genesis of fluid, speculative, and mystical Christianity. This book filled my spiritual uterus with a tampon of gnosis, and I just know it will do the same with you, my beloved true seekers. The most valuable commodity I know of is information. Wouldn't you agree? And that is David Brackey manifesting at the virtual Alexandria to discuss his new book, The Gnostics, Myth, Ritual, and Diversity in Early Christianity. David is also professor of religious studies at Indiana University. To wit in my witless banter, David's scholarship gives Viagra wood to the issue on who really were the classic Gnostics. He takes a penetrating middle path in between those insisting Gnosticism was an independent religion and those who are convinced it was just a Christian abortion. Once again, things that could have been brought to my attention YESTERDAY! He keenly modifies and refines accepted theories and viewpoints from the luminaries in the field, revealing that it's time to look with a maiden head eye at such terms as heresy, orthodoxy, alternative Christianity, Gnosticism, dualism, and many others. You see, the Gnostics did indeed exist, but not as we have believed. The real Gnostics thrive beyond, but influence the Valentinians, Cephians, Carpocratians, Ophites, and other schools of thought. And they were never truly at odds with quote-unquote orthodoxy, but actually worked hand-in-hand -hand with it as main architects of mainstream Christianity as we would know it. Marcus Aurelius had a dream that was Rome, Proximo. This is not it. This is not it. And you'll spit out your Red Bull or Starbucks via on your screen when you discover that many of the most orthodox church fathers were Gnostics at heart, and that the Gnostics laid much of the groundwork on later pagan systems than ever realized before. God bless those pagans. So, you might ask, who were damn dar real Gnostics? Well, that's what you'll find out in our interview with the erudite David Brackey. Unless you're already taking a few shooters of Jägermeister mixed with bleach because of my banter, or done your best impression of that dude from the movie Scanners who loses the mental battle at the conference. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't accept or at least consider David's compelling scholarship, you can always do what New Agers and many Gnostic callers do 
and just ignore it and accept ghost-written history, which they ironically always accuse the Orthodox of doing. We can no longer afford the mistakes of the past. But that does make sense, though. As Stephen Colbert said once, since we're doomed to repeat history, or forever relive it as Nietzsche and Uspensky propose, why not just rewrite it like a Texas school board and we'll be fine. Yeah, really fine. Just fine. I think they're looking for something worth dying for because it's easier than finding something worth living for. As I no duh recommend David's book, I contend that my book, Voices of Gnosticism, is the perfect consort. With this dynamic duo of tomes, you'll really gain a rich, panoramic snapshot of the esoteric bed of roses that is the first few centuries of Christianity, as well as heterodox Judaism and eclectic paganism surrounding it. I would further add The Gnostic Religion by Hans Jonas, because his reconstruction of those Greco-Roman times is eerily parallel to our times. And part of Aeon Byte's message is to distill from the cursed fig trees of the Gnostics elixirs that will intoxicate your imagination and creativity to the point we are finally able to face the quiet, frog and boiling water apocalypse that is the present. The apocalypse begins. Yay! And I will give you the method soon in 2011, at least before the Elohim ships come back to bugger us for information or the machines rise. Oh wait, the machines already rose. We're already their slaves without even knowing it. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. And um, if you can't wait, uh, my advice is go ahead and start a fight club. The first rule of fight club is, you do not talk about fight club. But enough of my, uh huh fooled you and made you release the button on the dynamite belt you bought at the Taliban radio shack. May Allah smile upon you always. One more thing before we are enlightened by David's research on his book, The Gnostics, Myth, Ritual, and Diversity in Early Christianity. One mistake I've made, and I'm evolving like you are, probably at a slower rate, is the concept of Gnosis. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? In the end? And we've spoken much about Gnosis in past episodes of Aeon Byte Gnostic Radio. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. Many cats out there always go about saying, Gnosis is direct experience with the divine. Not exactly, Montresor. Not exactly. You can get that dope in all religions if you pop the right mystic cherry. Gnosis brings results, it is not the result. Gnosis begins from beyond with the call of Hagia Sophia that stirs our divine spark, ignites our floundering longing and melancholy of this universe into a longing and melancholy for the higher realms and a higher state of awareness. Our third eye opens. Our trampled chakras reach out in unison for the beloved. That's now. In an hour, he could have total recall. But it's not a straight line, as the Valentinians and Sethians propose in their scriptures. Suddenly, you find yourself witnessing layers upon layers of realities, inside and outside of your perception each guarded by a Mephistophelian boss that requires a password or a good fight or some sort of sacrifice. And you are meant to engage each dimensional level, outwit each trauma sphinx, defeat each past relationship hydra, or avoid each shrugging atlas selling you the latest Apple product. Every single man or woman who has stood their ground, everyone who has fought an agent has died. 
But where they have failed, you will succeed. Why? Their strength and their speed are still based in a world that is built on rules. Because of that, they will never be as strong or as fast as you can be. And the journey is brutal, and your Adelon, or lower self, becomes a suffering servant, even as your daemon or higher self guides you through a million Via Dolorosas. Say hello to Golgotha, and say hello to Mara on steroids, my beloved true seekers. This is where we hold them! This is where we fight! This is where they die! And then, after all of this, you still have to rise through the aeons until you reach the primordial mother and father. And then who knows what happens next. What happens when a man goes through his own portal? We'll see. Sorry, but Gnosis is no direct experience with God or direct experience with the divine. What did you expect? Easy like Sunday morning? Easy like plucking a three-month-old dingleberry from your anus? Or one clicking for the latest Justin Bieber song on iTunes? Like a monkey ready to be shot into space. Space monkey, ready to sacrifice himself for great good. If you want an easy route, there are other faiths and ideologies that will sell you their quick fix, soul back guarantee spirituality at a low interest rate. Although they'll probably end up selling your debt to the Chinese anyway. I'm just saying, if it's too good to be true, well, you know how it goes. You should be a Johnny Cash body shatva and give it the finger. You want to be a champion eternal raging against heaven or linger in the end alone and afraid in a world you did not make. Oh, I see. So, so God is picking on you? Is that what you're saying? No, he's ignoring me completely. But enough of my drivel. David Brackey on The Gnostics. Myth, ritual, and diversity in early Christianity. Heresy shouldn't be this much fun, but it just is. You want to see a miracle, son? Be the miracle. <laughs> this is the Aeon Byte interview. And with us, we have the pleasure of being joined by David Brackey to discuss his new book, The Gnostics, Myth, Ritual, and Diversity in Early Christianity. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great, and uh, thank you very much for joining us to talk about this, uh, in my opinion, groundbreaking and already a classic book. Uh, you're very kind. Before we get to who really were the Gnostics, you write in your book that there are two models in understanding the development of Christianity. Mm -hmm. One is the one of Irenaeus, where Christianity grew uh, uniformly, but then splinters of heretical groups broke from it. The other is, and I love this uh, analogy, is the horse model race, where all these groups, Gnostics, Montanists, Marcionites, Encratites, Proto-Orthodox, and so forth, just shot out of the gate in the second century, fully mature, all racing to the finish line of respectability in Roman culture. <laughs> it's a great one. I mean, just a mental image. I love it. <laughs> but uh, you also uh, offer a third and more sensible alternative. Could you tell us about it? Uh, sure. I mean, first of all, we want to say that the, the kind of horse race model, as I called it, right, is actually a very good model. On the one hand, we want to give it props for doing what it does because it really highlights the fact that Christianity was diverse from the beginning and um, different groups had different traditions and interacted with each other and uh, that we shouldn't see that there was simply one dominant church from which other Christians like the Montanists or the Gnostics or the Valentinians just broke away from. So we want to say that's a good, it's a good model. But the, the problems with it are is that it kind of, um, I think, too much creates stable groups that are just uniform within themselves and separate from one another. 
And also, you know, the, 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 it has this kind of concept of proto-orthodoxy, that is that there was kind of one form of Christianity to which people like Irenaeus of Lyon, the Bishop of Lyon, and Origen, the great Christian thinker in the, in the third century, or Cyprian of Carthage, who was a major bishop there, that they all belonged to kind of one brand of Christianity, proto-orthodoxy, that then triumphed. And I think what scholars are moving towards now is not really so much a third model in the sense that we have a new kind of overall, you know, way of seeing everything. But I think scholars are now thinking more in terms of how different groups form their identities in interaction with each other and that these identities are always in flux and changing and that Christianity or we should say perhaps Christianities, are always being invented and reinvented in, in interaction with one another. And uh, that there really isn't, you know, before, you know, perhaps the late 3rd century and the beginning of the 4th century, a kind of single entity that we can call proto-Orthodoxy. Okay. Whether in the horse race model or in the Irenaeus model, there just isn't that one thing. Right. Yeah, and uh, even as you mentioned, there maybe never will be, because even up to today, Christianity is always evolving, interacting, and mutating. That's exactly right. And of course, I mean, you know, when, you know, some historians of Christianity, I think, would say that, you know, that there might have been periods like the Middle Ages or Byzantium in the West, in the East, when there was a kind of, you know, hegemonic single Christianity from which other groups could kind of break away from. But scholars would notice that even there, you know, there's always various practices that people are doing all over and that there is very seldom kind of the tight kind of control of what Christianity is, even in those situations. But certainly today, I mean, the varieties of Christianity and the different ways they define themselves, even within large organizations like Roman Catholicism, is astounding. It's just an ongoing process of of people making and remaking Christianity and what it is. And David, you give some great examples in your book uh, how all these Christian thinkers and their their schools and their churches overlapped. For example, <laughs> I was floored when you said that Irenaeus, who I often call the old battle axe <laughs> because he's always complaining about something, he uh, he believed in uh, what seven heavens and seven oh, yeah. guardians of heaven. Yeah. So uh, you know we like to think, oh, Irenaeus is just so different from the Gnostics, and of course Irenaeus would like you to think that, but um, but when you look at what he is doing, he's in the same worldview as the Gnostics, which is that there that God really can't be seen. There isn't just a single God and us. There really are, there's God in multiplicity and there are divine beings above us, of course, the way Irenaeus would think, right? So yes, he had this notion that there are, that there are seven heavens and there's a different spirit or angel ruling each of these and they have names like prudence and so on. And we read that and, you know, it's simpler than what the Gnostics had, but it's not so different, you know, from the perspective of you know, ours, from our perspective and the way we can see things. They're just not as distant from one another as any of these people would like you to think that they are. Another example, and of course this kind of breaks Michael Williams' concept of simply calling Gnosticism biblical demiurgists, mm -hmm. but the truth is that there were a lot of biblical demiurgics back then, weren't they? Oh, I mean, almost everybody who was Jewish or Christian and thought about things at all philosophically was a biblical demiurgist. That is, practically no one who was Jewish or Christian thought that simply God, by him or itself, created the world. All of them thought that there was some lower divinity that actually did the hard work of creating. I mean... And then you already see this in the New Testament, you know, where, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things came into being through the Word. Galatians, yes. Paul says, uh, angels handed Moses the Torah. And so That's forth. exactly right. So, so, you know, the kind of, if biblical demiurgical means, you know, you believe in a demiurge, that is a, cre a lower creator God than the highest God, and you think that, and you use biblical traditions to talk about that God, then, you know, Philo of Alexandria was one, the Gospel of John was one, the Book of Hebrews was one, Justin Martyr was one, e practically everybody was one. And the Gnostics certainly were as well, among them and the Valentinians and so on. 
and everybody uh, was doing it. Yeah, so they basically <laughs> made Jesus the demiurge, and there was no concept right. of the Trinity. He was just the uh, right force. Yeah, you def- you have the um, you know certainly in certain thinkers you have what we might call the raw materials of that would later become Trinitarian thought. Certainly, you know Justin Martyr who was in the mid-2nd century, I mean, he does talk about the fact that there's also this spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit, but he's much more interested in the relationship between father and son. So he's much more kind of into a kind of binatarian God with this spirit thing over here that he doesn't quite know what to do with. So the, the materials are there, but it's certainly not the, the trinity that we think of in, or that later became normative in the 4th century. They all think of... The, what we would now call the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God or the Word of God, as less fully divine than the Father, which is by later standards of Trinitarian orthodoxy, that's not the right way to think. But everybody thought that way at that time. Another important issue, David, that you bring up in your book, the Gnostics, mm-hmm. uh, again, before we really get into the to the juicy stuff, is the concept, <laughs> well, this is juicy, is the concept of heresy, which mm-hmm. originally might not have meant what we have been accustomed to believing. What did heresy mean in the early stages of Christendom? Well, at first, you know, in just general usage, I mean, before there were Christians, even, the Greek word hierasis, from which we get heresy, uh, was simply a neutral word that didn't mean anything particularly bad that meant, you know, a school of thought. So, you know, for example, the field of medicine could have multiple hierases in Greek or heresies, we'd say, or schools of thought. So that is different traditions of thinking about medicine that might ultimately go back to an original person like Hippocrates or someone. So you'd have the Hippocratic high racist or school of thought. And you do have early Jews and Christians who do use the word high racist in Greek in a kind of neutral way. The Jew Josephus in the first century identifies different groups of Jews, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, so on, as high racist. And he doesn't mean to say they're heresies. He just means to say they're different schools of thought within Judaism. And he says, I belong to the high racist of the Pharisees. And so he would certainly not want to say I'm a heretic, right? So it's only as, as Christians become more and more suspicious of divisions among themselves and they want to start, you know, what happens is they start accusing each other of not really being the truth, but being merely a school of thought. You know, and they start to use school of thought or high racist as a insult that means, you know, you're just an opinion or a, or a way of thinking you're not the truth which is what we Christians have, or at least we group of Christians that I belong to. So yeah, originally it was a neutral word, and it just it, it becomes bad you know, thanks to the work of certain Christian authors. So the notion of heresy just doesn't, isn't just there to use. It's, it's one that's actually invented through this process of identity formation that, that I was talking about earlier. So basically terms like heretics and proto-orthodoxy are just as problematic as Gnosticism. Oh, certainly, and at least heretic to its and heresy to its to their credit are words that ancient people actually used. I mean, you know, Justin Martyr and Origen and so on were happy saying those people over there are heretics and belong to a heresy. But proto-orthodox is a completely modern invention. It's a word that we have come up with to talk about people that we see now as orthodox in retrospect. And, you know, it's a good thing, you know, it was a good thing to come up with this word because we don't want to just say Justin was, Justin Martyr was orthodox because he, you know, simply wasn't and he wasn't there yet when orthodoxy had really been invented. So that, so the proto-orthodox was invented as a, as a good word, but I think it's also something that can obscure difference among people who we now see as proto-orthodox. And now to the main event, David. Um, <laughs> there's obviously uh, two paradigms or sides in the whole Gnosticism and the Gnostics uh, debate. Right. On one side, you have the Williams King paradigm that mm-hmm. thinks the uh, the term is problematic and should be discarded for something just like Christian or biblical mm-hmm. demiurgic. And mm-hmm. of course, on the other side, you have Birger Pearson, who believes that there were there were Gnostics, and we both know nobody's ever going to convince him otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> but and you also have Marvin Meyer on that side as well. 
but uh, you propose a sort of uh, middle way. Uh, don't you propose there were not only Gnostics, but actually two types of Gnostics? Yes, I mean, what I, what I argue is that, um, that uh, King and Williams are right, that the scholarly concept of Gnosticism is not productive. It's, it's too big and it includes too many different groups and people that are simply not the same. And uh, we group them together in this thing called Gnosticism, and it's, it's not right to do so because it distorts the groups that are put into that, into that uh, category. And, uh, and there wasn't actually one giant religion in antiquity called Gnosticism. So I agree with, with their basic point. In many ways, then, I, I kind of more belong to that camp, the King and Williams camp, than the camp that you're associate, you know, that Berger Pearson and Martin Meyer, who are great scholars as well, who want to argue that there really was an ancient phenomenon called Gnosticism. But what I want to say is, um, is a variation on both those those ideas and argue that there was in fact a group of Christians, a school of thought, you know, to use the term heresy in a neutral way, um, in which, which was known as the Gnostic school of thought in which people thought of themselves as Gnostics, but that that's a limited group and not, you know, is not inclusive of a whole bunch of different people. And so I would separate that group, for example, from the Valentinians, who I would see as a different movement from these Gnostics. So I want to continue to use the word Gnostic, but I want to use it in a very limited sense. But you also use the word Gnostic as the others who thought of themselves as perfected Christians, like Clement of Alexandria, That's right. perhaps. That's and, right. So we have to keep in mind, yeah, good, good point, which is that, um, you know, the Gnostic in antiquity, it looks like, um, had kind of two connotations. One was a kind of proper name of a school of thought. We belong to the Gnostic school of thought, just as today Christians might say, I'm a Lutheran or I'm a Presbyterian or whatever. But then it was also a kind of more general term to denote a person who had reached some form of spiritual perfection, and it did not then constitute any particular doctrinal affiliation or something. And Clement of Alexandria, who's usually designated as proto-Orthodox, called the ideal Christian a Gnostic, you know, there there seem to have been other groups who did so as well, and this use continued. A, a famous example is Evagrius Ponticus, who was a fourth century monk and probably the most, you know, the one of the most brilliant theorists of the monastic life in antiquity. He called the most advanced monk, the spiritually adept monk, also the Gnostic. That's right. There are in there are kind of two senses to the word Gnostic in antiquity, and we need to kind of be uh, attentive to those different uses and and keep them both separate and together at the same time. And the way you found out who the Gnostics were was uh, very interesting. A lot of people miss it, but you, by reading Irenaeus, who keeps saying, well, the Valentinians did this and the, the Marcionites did this or whatever, and then the Gnostics did this, most people always assume that uh, Irenaeus is just lumping them all together. But mm -hmm. was, he was really talking about one specific group. That's right. So, um, and, and, and at, some, at this point, I, I think I'll pause and say, you know, that I am not the only one to say this, so I'm not inventing this, so, you know, you shouldn't credit me totally with, uh, with discovering it. Okay. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm, I, I believe it's a hypothesis that's been out there among scholars, but, but people haven't really thought about it seriously enough. And the idea is that, that, is that if you read Irenaeus, he seems to be making a claim that there is this group called the Gnostics or the Gnostic School of Thought that is separate from other groups and that influenced Valentinus, but Valentinus was not a member, but he was influenced by them. And uh, so, yeah, and so if you pay attention to what he says about that group, and people have always noticed this, that he attributes to them a myth that is the myth that is narrated in the Apocryphon of John from Nakamadi or secret book, according to John, or Karen King calls it the rev secret revelation of John. And that's the myth that we as scholars have traditionally called the Sethian myth and have traditionally called the people who adhered to that Sethians or Sethian Gnostics. And, and I guess my proposal really is not, this is, this is not a new group that I've discovered, but that I'm proposing that that was the Gnostic school of thought and we should call those people Gnostics and not call anyone else Gnostics in the sense of a school of thought. 
So that's what I'm kind of using Irenaeus for. And that's going to be, that's probably one of the more controversial parts of this because I'm actually suggesting that Irenaeus isn't always lying. (laughs) 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 Yeah, that's another one. It's always hard. (laughs) That he's, you know, he is, uh, his his motives are not, uh, you know, he's certainly never writing you know, and he, he wrote his big work in, in the year 180, and it's clearly polemical and so on, called, you know, Detection and Overthrow of Gnosis, falsely so-called. So you, with a title like that, you know he's not being <laughs> neutral in what he's doing. But, you know, and so he's certainly not writing in order that historians from the 21st century can have an accurate view of the religious life of his time. That certainly was not his goal. But I do think that he, in his efforts to smear his opponents, and his main opponents are really the Valentinians. That's his main target. Those are the people he thinks are really threatening his congregation. Um, I think he does at times offer us accurate descriptions or does say things that actually were happening at his time, and I think this is one of them, one of the examples of that, because we can check it out, and I think it, it does check out when you look into it. But what if somebody comes and says, for example, Marcelina, who was a Carpocratian, yeah. she self-designated herself as a Gnostic. That's right. Do you right. think she was speaking in the context of a perfected Christian? Yes, that's what okay. I think. So, okay. yeah, so, so Irenaeus does say, well, Marcelina or Marcelina, she said she called herself a Gnostic, right? But it's interesting, he, he identifies her primarily as a member of the Carpocratian movement or whatever, and I think, therefore, what he's saying is, is that she used that term as Clement did. Remember, Clement of Alexandria, who is called a proto-Orthodox person, used the term Gnostic as a term of spiritual perfection. And I think this is most likely what she is doing as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's a, this, is, this is an argument, and I think that this point is probably the point where my argument is most vulnerable, I would say, because I am trying to distinguish between the use of Gnostic as kind of a, as this term of spiritual perfection, rather than as a designation of one's philosophical school allegiance, which I think is what the Gnostic school of thought was doing. And that's the kind of argument that I and other, you know, can have with people, and I'm perfectly happy to understand that people would see it differently. But that's how I would see, like, Marcelina. And I would also see that as the case of this group that Hippo- Hippolytus, another heresy I'll just talk about, called the Nassenes, and they too seem to have made the claim, we're so spiritual perfect that we are Gnostics. And what exactly is the problem with the term Sethian? Um, well, you know, in the end, well, first of all, we mostly made it up. It's certainly, it's not a term Irenaeus uses. It's not a term that Porphyry uses. Porphyry is a, is a Neoplatonist philosopher who also talked about the Gnostics and says, you know, there was a school of thought called the Gnostics. They don't use this term. The first term really first occurs with Epiphanius, a late 4th century heresiologist, so rather removed and, you know, there's no sense, you know, it's, it's not a bad term in the sense that these people did identify themselves as the seed of Seth, the descendants of Adam and Eve's third son, Seth. But I, it seems as though their preferred term for themselves was Gnostic, so we might as well use that since that's their preferred term. And if we go around talking about Sethian Gnostics, I think that kind of opens the door to other varieties of Gnostic. You see, if, if my argument is we should just call these people the Gnostics. I mean, once you start saying, oh, well, they're the Sethian Gnostics, that opens the door to saying, well, and over here are the Valentinian Gnostics, and over here are the Marcionite Gnostics, and that's precisely the route I don't want to go down, as, as, and, oh. you know, and that's the route that, you know, Karen King and Michael Williams have said is so unproductive, and that I agree with them. So that's why I kind of am hesitant to continue to use that adjective, but I understand its use, and I, I certainly don't, you know, jump up in meetings and say, stop using that, or anything like that. So. <laughs> yeah, actually, you made my, uh, even before your, bo- your book, and I don't know if it was synchronicity, but I was reading, uh, I believe it was Philo, uh-huh. and he also uses the term, the descendants of Seth oh, and certainly. the descendants of Cain. That's so right. this, uh, this already might have been in the air for Christians, you know? Oh, def- well, it's a, it's a, the Hebrew Bible, I mean, in Genesis and so on, just lend itself to this because, uh, you know, it is so interested in genealogies. You know, it's always stopping and saying so-and-so begat so-and-so, so-and-so begat so-and-so. And if you are someone like Philo or, you know, Origen or Irenaeus or any of these people, 
you've got to make sense of that, and it rapidly becomes one way of doing it is to talk about these different lineages like descendants of Seth, descendants of Cain, descendants of Jacob, and so forth and so on, represent like different types of people or different communities. You know, this kind of reaches its uh, climax in St. Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, you know, with his cities of God, uh, city of God, where he talks about, you know, two different cities on earth, the city of God and the city of humanity or the city of earth. And he too will trace this through lineages in the in the Hebrew Bible, in the, in the Old Testament. But he's not meaning this to be literal, like, you know, being a part of the city of God is transmitted genetically or something like that. But he's interpreting these stories to say something to us symbolic. And I think, you know, that's what Philo's doing. Descendants of Seth are virtuous. Descendants of Cain are not virtuous. And, you know, so why, they, they think, why does the Bible talk in these genealogical terms? It must be communicating to us something about different kinds of people. And so this usage was very, it was just out there. So it's no surprise that the Gnostics used this as well and identify themselves as descendants of Seth, really. And uh, David, could you give us some of the characteristics of the Gnostics or uh, the artists formerly known as the Sethians <laughs> <laughs> that uh, set them I'm apart? Gonna come, I'm going to have to come up with an unpronounceable symbol for that or something, right? <laughs> some, yeah, some Greek letter. Something <laughs> yeah, like some that. Greek letter that, you know, is, uh, that we can just all just look at and, and not really say. So, um, um, well, but uh, uh, yeah, that yeah. sets them apart from other Christian schools of thought. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, well, I think, um, you know, the, the, the main thing, of course, what's probably most distinctive about their teachings, obviously, is their myth, and that they see the ultimate God, the highest God, as essentially unknowable, um, remote, and indescribable. And this is a very typical way that people indebted to Platonist philosophy thought um, in this period. And so God must in order to communicate with and to engage with lower levels of reality, God must devolve. God must expand. And because God is mostly a thinker, God thinks, the nature of God is kind of intellectual. When God thinks, God it becomes multiple. And so one of the distinctive features clearly is to, um, is to um, tell a myth that really unfolds and celebrates the multiplicity of God, whose multiplicity really reflects the multiplicity of our own minds and, its, and their complexity. Um, so there's a lot of interest in the different, what they call eons within the eternal realm, which are kind of like ways of thinking, places, modes of time. It's kind of hard, you know, they're both actors, but not really actors and so on. And, of course, there, you know, one of the most distinctive teachings then is also that one of these eons, wisdom, kind of went wrong somehow, and the result is this lower form of divinity or divine life that they call Yaldabaoth, who is identified with the god of Genesis. And it is this actually this Yaldabaoth who created the world in which we live as a rather imperfect copy of the eternal realm. And so the story of humanity, and, and in so doing, he, was, he ended up dispersing into humanity some spiritual life or power from that upper realm that his mother wisdom um, inhabits. And the story of humanity and of God is of God's attempt to return this dispersed spiritual power to the eternal realm. And, and Jesus is coming as a way of like, making this news available to people and bringing them back, you know, to the knowledge of who they truly are, which is forms of this dispersed power. What distinguishes them very much from other Christians, of course, is this view of the God of the Bible, of the Genesis, you know, the Lord God in Genesis as essentially being this Yald of Oath, who is, who is not, you know, a, a wonderful divine character, but someone who's actually hostile to humans. And they, you know, and they also had distinctive, it seems, a distinctive form of baptism and, uh, and also practices that led them to have some form of mystical contemplation of these, of God and God's eons. That's, that's kind of things in a nutshell, but we can look at individual parts of that in greater detail if you'd like. Right, like, uh, for example, the five seals, I think most, yes. most believe it's just a ritual baptism. Right. I mean, they did. They definitely had some form of baptism that was central to their ritual life, and 
because they talk about it constantly and they in one text revelation of adam the author criticizes other groups for defiling baptism and having bad water and so forth and so on and and a distinctive part apparently of their baptismal ritual was something called the five seals and um you know, one of the most fun things about studying these people is trying to figure out what those five seals were. <laughs> and there's, I mean, no one knows the correct answer, really. And, uh, you know, until some other text shows up in an Egyptian cave somewhere, we may right, never know. Right. But, uh, but, you know, it, it, they could be five steps of a baptismal ritual, you know, like taking off your clothes, putting on some new robe or something. Um, they could be different five kinds of anointing. Because of course, anointing with oil was always a you know important part of baptismal rituals. So people wonder about what this is. But when you one of the distinctive features of the text that belong to this school is this mention of the five seals, right? Um, you don't find the five seals of baptism in say a, a Valentinian text. You know they don't they're not that's not part of their ritual life. So yeah, so one of the things that makes them distinct is not just a myth or a bunch of thoughts. It's an actual ritual which, you know, is why I think they were an actual group of people as opposed to, you know, just folks hanging out, writing, <laughs> you know, myths on their own, you know, or whatever, and riffing off other people's myths without any kind of real religious life to them. Uh, we talked before the interview how much I really enjoyed April DeConnick's The Thirteenth Apostle, especially yeah, her second that's a great edition. Book. Yeah, yeah, the, the second edition, and she actually focuses on uh, the astrology, the astrotheology, mm -hmm. magical rituals of the artists formerly known as the Sethians. <laughs> but you uh, complement this book, her book, very well because you actually you focus on how philosophy and tuning the mind mm -hmm. must have been very important to these people. Yes, I mean, I, you know, they have the, several of these texts are, there's always been this group of texts within the Gnostic set of literature that we've called kind of the Platonizing treatises or whatever, but, <laughs> but these are, which sounds very scary, and they are kind of difficult, but they, they, you know, focus very much on what we would call mysticism, some form of direct knowledge of God or contact with God. So, I mean, I think one thing that has been lacking in in work on Gnosticism is is that you know such there's been such a focus on the myth and how strange it is and so forth and so on that the devoted not enough attention to thinking what would be the payoff for people in doing this and I do think that this kind of interest in in some sort of mystical contemplative experience of God that's very philosophically based you know definitely comes out of a Platonist tradition must have been important to at least some people in the group. I'm, I'm excited when I go to meetings now because a lot of younger scholars are picking up on this and writing, you know, in their dissertations and so on about this aspect of, of the Gnostics and how their interest in mysticism and knowing God is actually influential on other people like Plotinus and so on. And, you know, and I think that's great. I'm thinking of uh, there's a guy named Zeke Mazur who's doing his Ph.D. at Chicago. There's a young man named Dylan Burns getting his Ph.D. at Yale. And they're really working on this stuff, and it's very exciting to me to see that kind of work happen because I think mysticism is an important part of what the Gnostics were about. Exactly. I mean, after all, as you point out, if they believed that God was this gigantic mind or computer up mm -hmm. there, they figure out, well, to become God, don't we have to get the circuitry of our mind correct? before that's right. we can know God. That's what Gnosis is. That's exactly right. I mean, I think God for them is, in a way, our minds writ large. But better, you know, that's our way of seeing their imaginative process. Uh, far better is to manage, is to, is for, is from their point of view, is to imagine that our minds participate in God. And so the structure and nature of our intellects mirror that of God's and participate in that of God's. So, so, you know, one reason that the myth of the Gnostics must be so complex is the mind is complex, if you start to think about it. And, um, and so, you know, they, when they talk about mysticism, one, you know, they kind of have two different ways of thinking about it, but they must be complementary for them. And one of them is certainly a kind of uh, turning inward an examination of one's own thoughts and thought structure and trying to think and contemplate one's own mind 
as abstractly as possible, not just thinking about what am I thinking about, you know, I'm thinking <laughs> about this door over here, but how you're thinking. And they believe that once you do that, you gain greater insight to, into God because our minds are modeled after that mind. And eventually you can, in fact, have some sort of acquaintance with God, which is what gnosis means, of course, is kind of a direct knowledge, what we would not just knowing that, for example, a city exists, but knowing the city because you've been there and, and experienced it. And that's what, you know, Gnosis is supposed to be. But our minds are in tune with God, and that's why God is complex, as our minds are complex, really. And would you say that the uh, Gnostics saw themselves as the highest branch of Christianity, uh, even though, as, you know, I talked with April DeConnick, she agreed that they really thought they were Christian bodhisattvas. They were full of compassion, uh -huh. <laughs> but they still saw themselves as above the, everybody, head and shoulder. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I definitely think they, they uh, let's put it this way, I'm sure they thought they were the most accurate form of Christianity. They were true Christianity. They were bringing the message that Jesus meant to bring. I'm hesitating about the adjective above because that might suggest that they think that other Christians are kind of just lower forms of them or on their way to be them. I think the Valentinians saw themselves that way. The Valentinians saw themselves as kind of a more advanced form of Christianity and other Christians are kind of junior Valentinians or whatever. But I think the Gnostics really saw themselves as being the right Christians and other people being wrong in the same way Irenaeus thought that other people were simply wrong. I mean, if, as I think, the newly discovered Gospel of Judas comes from these Gnostics or Sepians, as others would call them, it's very critical of other Christians. You know, it's not like we're just better than you. You know, you're not even really right about who God is, they're saying to other Christians. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, I think they were Christians, and I think they thought that their form of Christianity was the, was the true one, the most accurate one. And, that, and, so one, and one of the points of my book, then, is to say, you know, we, we like to sometimes think, oh, the Gnostics, they're like, cool people who are inclusive and, you know, <laughs> so forth and so on. But I expect they were just as adamant about the truth of their beliefs and the wrongness of other people's beliefs as anyone else was in antiquity. But they weren't really these, like, uh, rebellious people, as a lot of people like to paint them to be. Uh, no, and this is one, I mean... Protest exegetes, yeah. you know, that Rudolph yeah. talks about. And, right, uh, yeah, and I think this is an, a very important point that Michael Williams made in his book. I mean, the, one of the you know, great things about Michael Williams' book, which, you know, it's hard to believe it's been, like, 15 years now. I know. <laughs> oh. But um, one of the great things about it was, you know, he pointed out that Gnostics, their thought is much more engaged in some ways with, you know, the wider philosophical thought of the day than, for example, Irenaeus. So we think of them as kind of rebels and protesters, but they really are part of, I mean, to the extent that intellectuals aren't indeed a fringe, they're part of the fringe because they're definitely, they're yeah, definitely course, intellectual, course, yeah. but they're not really, you know, rebelling against something. They are actually participating in a wider conversation about, God and how we know God and so forth and so on that was, you know, widespread in antiquity. So they're not radical, wild protesters. They are participants in that conversation. The fact that, you know, a major important philosopher like Plotinus, you know, in the mid-third century felt like he had to write tractates against the Gnostics and explain how he really is different from these people shows that they really weren't so different from people like him. Right. Yeah. I mean, when people protest the most, oh, we're not like them, that's usually a sign that you're like them. <laughs> you know, the lady does protest too much. Yes, right? <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, if you have to spend, you know, page after page saying we are not like them and they're not us, that usually is a sure sign that there's something close to close to between these two groups. Yeah. yeah, and if Plotinus is giving somebody attention when we know what Plotinus thought of himself, that's pretty big. You know, that's <laughs> exactly. like a, a celebrity talking about you. It's a big deal back then. That's exactly right, yes. He, and he, he, yeah, he was not one to spend a lot of time worrying about people he thought were not, not worth thinking about. <laughs> What about their origins? I know, for example, mm -hmm. uh, Birger Pearson states that there were once Jews who became mm -hmm. later Christianized. Mm -hmm. I think John Turner and April DeConnick have this model where they might have been Jews and then they became Christian and then later on they were thrown out. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you stand? Because, you know, in a lot of their scriptures, 
has Jesus seemingly tacked on as a Johnny right. come lately, or there's no <laughs> Jesus at all. Yes. So how yes. do you explain these scriptures, mm -hmm. like the Apocalypse of Adam and right. uh, Marcianus yeah. and some of the others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I I do think that. Um, you know, that certainly the, you know, when, um, you know, kind of pre the prevailing hy hypothesis right now among scholars is that the Gnostics originated as, as kind of disaffected Greek-speaking Jews. Somehow you've got to have a Jewish element because why are these people so obsessed with Genesis? So, you know, usually it's hard to imagine that some just non-Jewish pagan person just decided to like pick up Genesis and create a whole mythology just around that book. You know, that's, it's right. so, um, so, you know, and, and so the Jewish hypothesis really is that Jews started making this myth before they had even heard about Jesus and that Jesus is indeed just, at, you know, is added later in a kind of secondary way. And I think there's a lot of virtue to that because it explains why they're so interested in, in what we now call the Old Testament and Genesis. And it, uh, you know, avoids Irenaeus' model of seeing them as, you know, kind of like bad Christians who've gone off the path. But unfortunately, then they, in this hypothesis, they kind of become bad Jews who've gone off the path of Judaism. <laughs> but that's what all Christians were, we should say, uh, at the beginning, that's right? That's true. They were, <laughs> so, uh, they were heretical so, Jews. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the question becomes... You know, I, I tend to belong to the school of thought that they were that they were Christian from the get go. Now we got to be clear about, you know, what does it mean to say a person is Christian? And I think what I mean to say by that is that I think from the get go these were people who knew about Jesus and felt that something had changed with Jesus and they needed to respond to that in some way. So now that ne doesn't necessarily mean then that that they would, for example, make their religion completely about Jesus. You know, I mean, certainly Christians did and do, right? And that's kind of what we think a, a Christianity would look like as being totally Jesus-focused. So, um, but I think we should imagine that they, you know, knew about Jesus. They think something had changed with Jesus and there was something new. One reason I believe this, and then I'll come back to this issue of the lack of Jesus in certain Gnostic texts, um, one reason I think this is the decision to make the God of Genesis this malicious, ignorant deity, Yaldabaoth. It's very hard for me to understand pretty much any ancient Jew doing this without some message that says something has radically changed and is completely different and that, has, and that we've had a revelation of a, of a new and higher God. Right, which I think is what they're interpreting Jesus is. I mean, Jews have throughout history suffered various ills and so forth and, and so on, but Jews never say, therefore, our God is evil. They always say things like, we have sinned, God's ways are inscrutable, these kinds of things. So I really think what, what's needed here is not just Jews who feel disaffected and are you know, and are um, heavily influenced by Platonism and so on. But they, 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 something new needs to have happened that says, here's a new revelation of a God even higher than the God we thought we knew. And I think that's what they see happening in Jesus. Now, you're exactly right that, you know, some of the texts then that would come from this group that I and others think come from it, you know, Jesus is indeed not a hugely prominent character. I mean, the Apocalypse of Adam is a good example because it doesn't mention Jesus at all, at least overtly, though I, I still think, I mean, I happen to think that this human being that the rulers were chastised in his flesh could be a reference to Jesus. But it is true that in a, in a document like uh, the Apocrypha of John or whatever, Christ is a very important figure. And yeah, Jesus tends to come at the end of these things. Sometimes it seems tacked on. Um, but I think that from the get-go, they saw something new had happened in this Jesus person. Some new revelation had occurred. And maybe it wasn't for them all about Jesus. It was really all about God, for example. And so Jesus isn't as prominent in this literature as we might think. Certainly, the external evidence that we have is always that they were Christians. Because the people who talk about them, like Irenaeus and so on, say they're Christians. Of course, Irenaeus says they're not real Christians. They're false, horrible <laughs> Christians. I, I think that almost certainly they were you know, from a Jewish background, but I think they, the, er, the earliest Gnostics were from a Jewish background. That's all why we're concerned for the Septuagint. But I think that something had happened that, to their mind, revealed a higher deity. And I think 
that something was was Jesus for them. So I don't think that they are, you know, something that happened before there was Jesus and then later learned about him and said, oh, let's add him to our to our story, to our path pantheon. I think they were thinking about these issues post Jesus from the start. I think. I mean, I don't want to yammer on, but I want to, you know, very much say that I and the others who think this way, um, you know, and I think Karen King is one of those who would agree with me that, you know, these folks are just Christians. We are not, you know, adhering to some sort of Irenaeus model where, you know, there was original Christianity and the Gnostics kind of went astray from that. Um, But that when this Jesus event happened um, and people went about saying things have changed because of Jesus, you know, it was like, uh, you know, like, in a kind of an explosion and things went off in all sorts of different directions and all sorts of movements and trajectories formed around what Jesus meant. And so there wasn't like one Christian thing then from which the Gnostics derived, but they were just one of these many kinds of movements and ways of thinking that developed in light of what happened in the light of the Jesus event. They may not look as Christian to us as other groups did, but I think Christ and Jesus were part of it from the start. Certainly the Gospel of Judas, and then I'll stop on this point, the Gospel of Judas, if it's the Gospel of Judas that Irenaeus is talking about, which I think it is, is then, along with the Apocrypha of John, one of the earliest datable Gnostic texts. And it's thoroughly Christian. You know, it's all about Judas and Jesus. So, so yeah, so that's, that's an important new piece of data in this in this issue of were the, Christ, the, the Gnostics Christian from the get-go or not. Another point, David, that you seem to go against the grain and not, uh-huh. is the concept of dualism. You uh-huh. seem to think that for the artists formerly known as Sethians <laughs> were not as dualistic as other scholars uh, pretty much say. Yeah, I don't think, I, I think dualism is really not a helpful word when you apply it to this group because, I mean, I mean, there's there's different kinds of dualism, but strictly speaking, dualism is that there are two eternal principles, you know, either light and dark, good and evil, whatever, and that these are, you know, opposed principles that maybe one will eventually overcome the other, whatever, but one does not derive from the other. They are somehow independent dual principles. The Manichaeans, who come later, right, with Mani in the third century, they seem to have been what we would call actual dualists, right, to believe in two principles from the beginning, right? The Gnostics clearly are not this because they really believe that the great invisible spirit, you know, the the invisible virgin spirit who is the ultimate God, the father of the entirety, he is the source of all that is, right? I mean, even the world in which we live, as flawed as it is, as as flawed as it is in, in their view, has its ultimate source in them. So, I mean, they really are monists in the end, in the sense that they believe everything comes from one God. Now, I think they are, you know, you can use dualists in a kind of softer sense, people who, for example, distinguish very sharply between the spiritual or intellectual realm of existence and the material type of existence. And, of course, you know, in that case, the intellectual or spiritual mode of existence is what's really real, and this world, materiality, is not as real, perhaps not even ultimately real, and that's just basic Platonism, really. In that sense, you can call them dualists because they do make that distinction pretty sharply. But strictly speaking, I think to say, oh, they're dualists, as opposed to other Christians who are not dualists, I don't think that's very helpful because uh, other Christians can, in fact, be just as intense on distinguishing between spirit and flesh or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I I don't want to call them dualists in that kind of strict sense of having two ultimate principles, because they really don't think that way. David, what do you think happened to the Gnostic school of thought? People want to have this this romantic notion (laughs) that Constantine with a sword went from house to house and killed each one of them, but (laughs) uh, that's not what happened, right? We know that. No, I don't think so. I mean, part of the problem is, uh, I mean, in the end, we don't really know. Let's put it that way. But um, my own view is that that they were probably never a big group to start with. And I think by the time the fourth century dawns, you know, around, you know, by the time we get to 300, they were probably not many Gnostics left. 
and I think this for a couple reasons. I think one is that, you know, in reaction to them and in dialogue with them, a, you know, other groups had formed, and among them were the Valentinians, and I think they were turned out to be a much more kind of successful movement than the Gnostics, and I think I could see that the Valentinians as being a kind of good, you know, alternative for Gnostics in some some place that they would move towards eventually. You know, when, when Porphyry talks about them as interacting with Plotinus in the middle of the third century, you know, they seem to be much more engaged perhaps in, in discussion with other Platonists than with other Christians, which, you know, may be a sign that they're just feeling in, increasingly less at home, although they probably never felt at home, in the wider Christian network of things. And, um, you know, when you just don't hear as much about them in the 4th century. I mean, in the 4th century, you have Epiphanius complaining about these people and telling wild stories of them, like, engaging in ritual cannibalism and stuff. But that seems to, that sounds like, you know, oh, in the old days, there were these evil Gnostic people, and they did all these <laughs> terrible things, and they're still around, watch your children, <laughs> lock your doors, and so on and so forth. And so I think what happened to them is I think they just kind of, in some ways, petered out, I think. You know, other groups like the Valentinians picked up some of the people who had those kind of mystical interests. As you pointed out, their literature doesn't feel, from our perspective, particularly Christian. And Christ isn't a big deal, and, and, and so on. And I think as time went on, and, you know, it feels very Jewish and not really so much Christian. I think as time went on and the lines between who is a Jew and who is a Christian became much more a matter of clarity, they found themselves probably in, a, in an increasingly difficult position as well. I mean, I think their kind of unique mode of Christianity became increasingly less possible, not because some government was saying, don't do this, but because the ritual and communal life and, and thought world of Christians and Jews just simply evolved in a way that, that gave them, I think, less space um, to have a kind of productive existence. So that's, I belong to the, the, they just kind of petered out, really. I think the Valentinians lasted longer, and I think they were, you know, I think there you can start perhaps, you know, giving Constantine and, and the bishops and emperors who followed him and were in concert with, with imperial policy, you can start giving them, those people some credit for getting rid of groups like the Valentinians and others. And it would be reasonable to say, too, that perhaps the uh, Sethians or the Gnostics were, some of them might have been absorbed into Neoplatonism, or as, right. as Jason B. Dunn explains, mm -hmm. uh, we always forget about the Manichaeans, who were just yep. as successful as converting people, and they might have easily converted the Gnostics in Alexandria and other parts of the empire. Oh, I totally agree with that. I, I was holding out the Valentinians as one option for them, but I completely agree they could have just been, you know, gone off into Neoplatonist groups, but the Manichaeans would have been another great um, uh, place for Gnostics to end up because, um, you know, despite the fact I don't want to call them Gnostics, I do agree with people who point out the resonances between Manichaean teaching and mythology with the Gnostics. And yes, the Manichaeans were extremely successful. And, you know, I think people who study Christianity third century and later just often totally underestimate just, yeah, the importance of Manichaeism as a movement and its attractiveness to a lot of people. That's exactly right. And how have other scholars received your book so far, David? Um, well, it's only been out for a couple months, so there hasn't been much. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten a few nice emails saying, you know, this is great, thank you. And uh, the main reaction so far has been, um, you know, and whether this is a good thing or not, I don't know, is they felt like it probably is a, is a book that you can really use in a classroom. That's the, one of the big reactions I've gotten, so, which I hope is a good thing. It means it's accessible oh, it is a good and people, thing. Can, people can read it. But no, I'll be interested to see. I do know, I mean, I mean, I already know that the thesis I'm proposing has not, is, you know, I'm not proposing it for the first time. It's been kind of out on the table, proposed by, you know, people like Bentley Layton and, and to some extent Mark Edwards and Alistair Logan, and hasn't commanded the you know, adherence of a lot of scholars. And so one reason I wrote the book was to try to persuade more people of this way of looking at the Gnostics. 
And so we will just have to see. I mean, so far I've just gotten nice emails from people who've read it saying, oh, it's great, or I, you know, and, it, and I got an email from someone who was already able to use it in a class the last couple of weeks of last semester, and, and they said the students really liked it. So, so we shall see. Ask me about it in a year, and I'll be able to say more, I hope. <laughs> I will, but you won't, you won't convince a bigger Pearson, I know that. Because I don't think so, but, I, uh, uh... but that's okay. I mean, I mean, um, he, I mean, what a great contribution he has made to scholarship, oh, yeah. and, oh, yeah. um, and all of us are in his debt. You know, I do disagree with him about, uh, about uh, the way he sees Gnosticism as a larger phenomenon, but few people are as knowledgeable about all of the different um, movements and so on in antiquity that contributed to um, what I'm calling the Gnostics, especially, you know, Hellenistic Judaism and so on. And uh, so, no, great scholar, great guy. What's the legacy that the Gnostic school of thought left on Christianity? I think they left, um, you know, one of the things I want to uh, say in this book is that you know, the, there was, you know, we often hear that the church rejected Gnosticism, and uh, one of the things my book wants to say is there was no Gnosticism, big, big, big Gnosticism. There was this Gnostic school of thought, and there wasn't, of course, a single church. And reject is too simple for what was going on. I think the Gnostics contributed to how Christianity developed in several ways. Of course, one of them is negative, you know, so to speak. Not negative, because I think it was bad, but a lot of what how Christians developed was, of course, a response to them to say, we don't agree with that, so we have to come up with an answer to what they're saying. So one way they left the legacy was simply by having ideas that other Christians were like, no, 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 we don't like that, so we have to come up with our own thought about the, the questions they're raising. But I think they, they left other things. One is, and Karen King pointed this out, and she's exactly right, the Apocryphon of John, or Secret Book According to John, is really the earliest datable book we have today that provides a kind of Christian comprehensive account of human salvation from God to the future consummation of, of all things. And so they kind of set a precedent of saying one of the tasks of a Christian intellectual or thinker is to come up with such a comprehensive vision. And so I think they left that audacious act to come up with a comprehensive vision of of God and the world. Uh, they left that as a legacy. I think their interest in the demonic rulers that oppose, Christ, oppose human beings and, and prevent us from being virtuous, they're very interested in the various demonic cohort that is around the Alt of Oath and how they obstruct our quest to be good, virtuous people. I mean, that's picked up by not only people like Origen, but later by desert monks, right? We Christians develop a great interest as well in that. So I think they contributed to that conversation and their mysticism. I mean, and as I said earlier, this is one of the things that really interests me about the work of some younger scholars is I think they're showing how works like Zostrianos, and the Foreigner and Marsanes, these Gnostic texts that, that talk about mystical acquaintance with God, how they actually influenced other people like Plotinus and so on, and, their, and through him, you know, of course, people like Pseudo-Dionysius and so on. So I think that's also part of their legacy, part of the things that Christianity, as we know it in various forms, has taken into itself from the Gnostics. So they weren't just rejected, they were interacted with, and some of their ways of doing things were actually assimilated into other forms of Christianity. Well, I think that's all the time we have today, David. I'd like to great. thank you very much for coming on Aeon Byte and uh, give us, uh, giving us a great conversation. It was great to talk to you, Miguel. All right, well, you have a good day and good luck with the book. Thanks so much. And there you have it, my beloved true seekers, David Brackey on... The Gnostics, Myth, Ritual, and Diversity in Early Christianity. And now you know that the artists formerly known as the Sethians were the true Gnostics. Or maybe not. Like many guests admit, including David, we've only just begun our understanding of the Nag Hammadi Library and other Apocrypha. We've only just begun. Scholarship is still very anorexic. I should note that the church in Lyons, where Irenaeus, the old battle axe, once lived, 
allegedly has a zodiac diagram in it, which basically means that he did believe in the whole concept of heavens and demiurges and angels and archons, and that the Gnostics, in their platonic element, figure out what science has figured out, and that is that the human brain is the most complex and powerful system in the universe. Think of that joining the mind of God that is basically the biology of the Pleroma. And beyond the artists, formerly known as the Sethians, David's book does a cracking job at cataloging the other theories on who were the Gnostics, granting concise overviews on the Valentinians, Marcionites, and other early Christian heretics and explaining the theologies of many of the more radical church fathers like Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen, and mucho más. It's just the best work since the second edition of the 13th Apostle by April DeConnick, in my humbled opinion. And like I said, with Aeon Bite's Voices of Gnosticism, you'll have one of the best panoramic snapshots of the esoteric bed of roses of the first few centuries of Christianity, as well as heterodox Judaism and eclectic paganism surrounding it. And some of you will be saying, well, what about the Ophites, Nassines, Simonians, Carpocratians, followers of Basilides, and other Gnostic sects? Well, they do carry some weight, but not enough in academia, since we have no extant writings on these idolaters. All we have is the often deranged church father rantings and quotations, which we must take with a grain of crack cocaine for the time being. But I'm confident the sands of Egypt, when Thoth and Hermes deem it necessary, will grant us some more fragments of the faith's almost forgotten, paraphrasing J.R.S. Meads. Be patient, because you'll need all of your energy when we storm the gates of hell and rage against heaven for our paradise's loss and misplaced childhoods. So let me quote a passage from the Nag Hammadi libraries on the origins of the world. This covers much of my drivel in the introduction and what David Brackey spoke about concerning the mythology and philosophy of the artists formerly known as the Sethians. And thus when the world had come into being, it distractedly erred at all times. For all men upon earth worshipped the archons from the creation to the consummation both the angels of righteousness and the men of unrighteousness. Thus did the world come to exist in distraction, in ignorance, and in stupor. They all erred until the appearance of the true man. In other words, we have to get out of the true man show. And you, my beloved true seekers, are the true man. You are true man, the cosmic Adam the human of light, a modern-day Tom Sawyer. All you have to do is remember and imagine. And that's about it, because I can't surpass the keenness of David Brackey or any of our guests. Again, thank you for those who support Aeon Bidenostic Radio and spreading the word so more of you can become the word made on flesh. Yes, we are the Gnostics, the lovers of the esoteric and the Dionysian freethinkers. We're writing our own gospels and living our own myth. We've lost our mind and come to our senses. We don't suffer from insanity, but revel in it. We've crucified our Adelon or lower self and risen from the graves of group thought into our daemon or higher self. The new or old boss won't fool us again. Our mind is not for rent by any god or government. We are the revenge of the myth, the lords of deconstruction, and the champion eternals. Divided we stand, 
together we rise. And we have only begun our revolution of the spirit and mind in the name of Hypatia of Alexandria against Saclas, the foolish god. We're coming for you, Jehovah. I am and I am Abraxas, broadcasting at the virtual Alexandria through the God above God dad can. The road has ended, the song is over, thought I'd have something more to say. But don't cultivate any troubles, my beloved true seekers, because like heaven above you, the spy that loved you, I'm keeping all of your secrets safe with me tonight. Hello and goodbye as always. You mean?